It was because I had nothing to do, and you had. I was thinking of you, for I myself would like to talk for two or three hours as usual. I was reared to think of others always, never of myself, and I have ever tried to spread that doctrine by proxy. The older we grow, the greater becomes our wonder at how much ignorance one can contain without bursting one's clothes. Ten days ago, I did not know anything about the university settlement except what I'd read in the pamphlets sent me. Now, after being here and hearing Mrs. Hewitt and Mrs. Thomas, it seems to me I know of nothing like it at all. It's a charity that carries no humiliation with it. The speakers before me have told how you have to drive pupils away from your schools instead of into them. It was not that way in my young days. When I came down here this afternoon, I saw in the building a dancing class. You must pay a cent for a lesson. You can't get it for nothing. It is well to make people pay for what they get. That is why your charity does not humiliate. By the way, the reason I never learned to dance was because these schools for that art charged money. But it was the pawnbroker shop you have here that interested me mightily. I have known something about pawnbroker shops in my time. But here you have a wonderful plan. The ordinary pawnbroker is allowed to collect from his patrons an enormous percentage. He fleeces the straggling stranger. I have paid much to them. Just now I saw a man pledge a watch in your shop for two dollars. He wanted the money only for a fortnight, and the price charged for the loan for that time was only a penny. I wish I could have gotten such terms when I was young. The reason I speak so feelingly on the subject of pawn shops is that I once had a romance which was closely connected with an establishment of the kind. The other day I was looking through that autobiography which I am building for the instruction of the world when I came across an incident that I had written several years before. It was something that happened in San Francisco a long time ago. At that time, I was a newspaper man. I was out of a job. There was a friend of mine, a poet, but as he could not sell his poems, he also had nothing to do for a living, and he was having a hard time of it, too. There was a love passage in it, too, but I will spare you that and leave you to read it in my book. Well, my friend, the poet, said to me that his life was a failure, and I told him I thought it was, and then he said he thought he ought to commit suicide, and I said, all right, which was disinterested advice to a friend in trouble. My advice was positive. It was somewhat disinterested, but... There were a few selfish motives behind it. As a reporter, I knew that a good scoop would get me employment, and so I wanted him to kill himself without letting anybody but me know about the deed. Then I could sell the news and get a new start in life. The poet could be spared, and so, largely for his own good and partly for mine, I urged him not to delay in doing the thing. I kept the idea in his mind. You know, there is no dependence in a suicide. He may change his mind. He had a preference for a pistol, which was an extravagance, for we hadn't enough between us to hire a pistol. A fork would have been easier. I told him that, as we were financially crippled, we could not buy a revolver. Then he wanted a knife. 
To that I objected too on the same grounds. At last he mentioned drowning and asked me what I thought of it. I said that it was a very good way, except that he was a fine swimmer, and I did not know whether it would turn out well on this account. But I consented to the plan, seeing no better one in sight. So we went down to the beach. I went with him because I wanted to see that the thing was done right. You know the curiosity some people have. When we reached the shore of the sea, a wonderful thing happened. He was all ready to take the fatal leap. I was ready to see him do it. Providence interposed. From out the ocean, born, perhaps from the other side of the Pacific, there was washed up on the sand at our feet a gift. A gift that the sea had been tossing around for weeks, maybe, waiting for us to come down to the coast and receive it. What was it? It was a life preserver. Now, you can imagine the complications that arose. The plan to do the suicide act by the drowning method fell through with a crash. With that life preserver, you see, he might have stayed in the water for weeks. I couldn't afford to wait that long. Suddenly, I had an idea. That was no trouble for me, for I have the habit of having them often. He never had any, especially when he was going to write poetry. I suggested that he pawn the life preserver and get a revolver. The preserver was a good one. To be sure, the ocean had kept it for us a long time, and it had a few holes in it, but yet it was good enough to pawn somewhere. We sought the pawnbroker. He wanted 10% a month on the loan from the life preserver. I didn't object, for I never expected to try to get it out again. All I wanted was a revolver. Quick! The pawnbroker gave us an old derringer, which is a kind of pistol that has but one barrel and shoots a bullet as big as a hickory nut. It was the only firearm he would let us have. Then he grew suspicious, wanted to know what we were going to do with the derringer. I drew him aside. My friend is a poet, I said, and he wants to kill himself with it. Upon which he replied, Oh, well, if he is only a poet, it's well. God speed him. We went out and loaded the pistol. Just then I had some qualms about staying to see the act of my friend. I hadn't objected to witnessing a drowning, but this shooting was different. The drowning might have been looked upon as accidental, but not so with this. But I calmed myself, for what I suggested that I might go away, he grew uneasy and acted as though he would not carry out his purpose if I did not stay beside him. So I stayed. He placed the barrel at his temple. He hesitated. In spite of all I could do, I waxed impatient. Pull the trigger! I cried. He pulled it. The ball went clean through his head. I held my breath. Then I found that the bullet had cleaned out all the gray matter. It had made a new man of him. Before he shot that shot, he was nothing but a poet. Now he is a useful citizen. The ball just carried the poetic faculty out of the back door. Ever since then, although I am aware that I assisted him in the crime for selfish ends, I have been wishing that I might again help some other poet, or many of them, in the same way. Now, therefore, I realize that there's no more beneficent institution than this penny fund of yours, and I want all the poets to know this. I am going to tell all the poets I know where your shop is located. Of course, you have lots of other good things in your establishment besides the pawn shop, and I have been thinking of sending you my check to help along your work. But I have decided instead to send to your library a lot of those books of mine that I hear one of your small boys has dubbed Strawberry Finn. 